Um, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Department of Performance Studies at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts to uh, a very special evening in which we get to talk to Professor Francis Cisco Bradley of the Pratt Institute about his wonderful new biography of the great bassist and composer and social organizer, William Park, both of whom are joining us tonight to, uh, to celebrate the publication of this wonderful book called Universal Totality, The Life and Music of William Parker. So what I'd like to do very briefly is um, introduce William and Cisco, and then um, try my best to step out of the way as deftly as possible as they begin to talk and tell us a little bit about this, 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 this wonderful book. And as then we broaden out to begin to try to talk a little bit more about William's work as a, as a musician and as a organizer and as a really one of the seminal artists of the last, man, I hope I don't make you feel old when I say this, William, but of the last half century now um, in New York and in the world. So um, anyway, um, Cisco Bradley is a scholar of social and cultural history set in diverse contexts. Throughout his career, his interests have settled on the historical agency exhibited by people marginalized by global or local forces who face myriad challenges, including dislocation, cultural destruction, social alienation, or structural or physical violence. This has led him to investigate histories in a variety of contexts, including port cities, mobile intellectual or artist communities, and inhabitants of maritime settings where people are stitched together through viable but vulnerable social networks of their own making. He explores these issues very deeply in his first book entitled Forging Islamic Power in Place, The Legacy of Sheikh Daoud bin Abdallah al fatani in Mecca in Southeast Asia, which is coming out, um, which is published by University of Hawaii Press. And since setting in Brooklyn, um, where he's teaching now at Pratt Institute, Professor Bradley has added a new field to his interests, that of the history of the avant-garde jazz scene in Brooklyn and more broadly in New York City. And this project has led him to study the underbelly of New York City, gentrification, structural violence, and avant-garde art forms and how they relate to a far-flung, diverse, globally drawn community of artists and their social and cultural networks he chronicles much of this work on his website, which is www.jazzrightnow.com, which I will put, and I'll put that um, address in the chat for everybody. Um, okay. um, William Parker doesn't need really much of an introduction for those of us who have drawn on and fallen in love with and been um, sustained by, by music and particularly the, the genre of music that is sometimes or often called free jazz. He's a bassist, improviser, composer, writer, and educator um, from New York City, born in the South Bronx. And he's been heralded by the Village Voice as the most consistently brilliant free jazz bassist of all time. In addition to recording over 150 albums, He's published six books, poetry, criticism, interviews, and taught and mentored hundreds of young musicians and artists. And maybe most importantly, he, along with his partner, Patricia Nicholson, have for almost a quarter of century run the organization Arts for Arts, who's done so much tremendous work on developing and, and fostering and cultivating the arts community in, in New York City, particularly in downtown. Manhattan, and who is most importantly, most famously known for um, for over 25 years of running what is called the Vision Festival. Um, um, in addition, um, he, Williams played on so many different levels and so many different orchestras and so many different bands, but those of his own devising of the Little Huey Creative Music Orchestra in order to survive um, 
He was a, a, a member of the great Cecil Taylor unit called the Field Trio. Um, he's played with just about everybody that you could possibly imagine. Um, and is, again, as I said, simply one of the most important artists now living in the world. Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome them both. And, um, and I wanna begin by just asking uh, you, Cisco, and you, William, to talk a little bit about the book and the origins of your collaboration on this book. So. William, do you wanna, you wanna lead the way or? Oh, either way, it's fine. <laughs> You're muted, William. You got, you're muted. Let's see. All right. Okay. okay there you, no, go. I was saying, you go ahead first, Cisco. Oh, okay. Well, I, you know, this, this book, it, uh, I mean, I, I, I try to keep it a short story in a way. I, I, you know, I first encountered William's music in around, around 2005 when I first started listening to this kind of music in general. And I was living in Madison, Wisconsin as a graduate student at the time. So you know, I never, at that point, ever thought I'd be, you know, ten years later writing a, a book about uh, about William Parker. Um, I, mean, I remember encountering his record "Sound Unity," uh, which is an incredible record with his quartet, and um, you know, that kind of sent me on a journey. I mean, I, there were a few records that I listened to around then, and that was one of the one of the major ones that that got me interested in the music. And then, yeah, you know, I. I after moving to Brooklyn in 2011 and, and starting at Pratt, I, I began going to concerts and uh, really delving into the live scene in New York, which is so deep and so rich. Uh, I feel incredibly fortunate to be living in New York because of you know, every night. I always say that you know, pretty much on any given night, there's three to four, maybe five concerts that I would like to attend, and you know, it's like it's such an incredibly rich, uh, deep music scene. Uh, and I naturally met William Parker. Um, I, I actually, the very first time I saw him play was uh, at the uh, uh, the Clemente, Clemente Soto Velez uh, Cultural Center on the Lower East Side, uh, where he was playing with a, in a duo with Charles Gale, uh, one of the great saxophone players you know ever to play. So, um, and then from that point on, I just began invest, you know, sort of you know, investigating his music both on record and of course live. Um, you know, I guess to, to get on to talking about the book, um, I approached William in 2014 uh, about just doing an interview for the website that I run. And we met and I, I usually try to keep my interviews very open to see what artists might wanna talk about. And William wanted to talk about uh, music as healing. Uh, and we had an incredibly an incredible conversation about it. And I went and I published that interview. And at that point, I just realized, I mean, I think, you know, how many more conversations I, th I felt like we had just scratched the surface in talking about, you know, what music was to him. So uh, about a year later, I, I approached him again. Um, and this time, you know, talking about maybe doing a book. And I, you know, I didn't know how he would respond, but he, you know, he wrote right back. And, and from that point on, we worked pretty steadily on it from January 2016 for about three years straight. So over the course of that, we, 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 uh, we conducted, I think, 21 interviews. Um, I think I had maybe 35 hours or something like that, you know, 30 to 35 hours of, of, of you know, sort of recordings of, of these interviews with, um, with William Parker. And, um, and we talked about all sorts of things. Um, and it, you know, I feel like it was a pretty dynamic process from the beginning. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that the chapters that emerged out of it really just emerged out of the conversations that we were having um, for the most part. I mean, there were things that I had to add on a little bit in terms of my own sort of historical research, but I feel like, you know, I tried to structure the book kind of out of the conversations. And I think from the beginning, at least from my perspective, what I was aiming to do is really try to illuminate in, in a book, in book form, you know, the artistic vision of William Parker. So the singular, you know, sort of vision that he has, you know, where he came, where did he come from? Where, how did he come to those kind of those ideas um, and to, to delve into it? And I knew it was, you know, I mean, it, 
we talked about music, we talked about poetry, we talked about film, and all of that I thought was incredibly rich. And and from that point on, it was just clear to me that you know that uh, you know, that we had more than enough material to 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 you know to to fill this book. So um, if anything, it was sometimes a process of trying to to you know figure out what to include. Um, so. Uh, you know, that's that's where the, the book began and um, I would love to hear William maybe speak about his perspectives on the process um, but yeah that's where I, I think I was coming from well I think that everyone every human being and every creative human being um, you know starts life and has this journey and uh, first of all I'd say like I feel very very lucky that um, my path led me to meet along the way to meet very inspirational figures and to do things that uh, would help open up an area for me and inform me. Because uh, there was a lot to talk about. I mean, I, I remember uh, th things that happened to you that you don't even know were were really re relevant to your life until maybe later on. Um, so I thought all these things should be conveyed and, um, you know, recorded. So I was, I was very happy. I thought it would make a good story sharing this information, but more on a, that not that I had done this, but that it could be inspirational to other people who are trying to find out who they are, what they want to do, or how they're going to learn what they that what they're going to end up doing, and the process. <clears throat> Say, for example, I mean, when um, I was a kid, okay, we had uh, you know you play cowboys and Indians, and uh, me and my brother, we would take the guns that we had, and we would turn them around. And pretend like they were trumpets and our favorite uh, game was jam session so we'd always play jam session and i was trying to figure out like how did we get to that is because uh, when i was six seven every night my father would put on duke ellington you know crescendo and diminuendo and blue and, and we'd listen to paul gonzalez's solo and we danced to it and somehow that was important. Now, he didn't say this is Duke Ellington and he did this and he did that, but he played it every night. And so when we were playing our games, we wanted to play jam session. We wanted to play musician. We would we would uh, invent musicians who took, I remember I had a musician who, who would take a solo for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And my brother would say, no, I'm taking a solo for three weeks, you know? So it was like that and we were all inspired by the by paul gonzalez and duke ellington and then things just came into place so uh it wasn't later on you know my father brought home a trumpet for me alto saxophone for my brother it wasn't later on that i found out that it was my father's dream to have me and my brother play in duke ellington's orchestra because he never said so and uh and then later on you know way after he had died I was in Germany doing a um, a, a tour with the bass player Stefan Grimes Gamis, and we were in Europe somewhere. And I, you know, I took a little nap in the afternoon, and, and I had a dream. And my father came to me in a dream, and he said, um, "You know, I'm a composer also." And he had these charts with triangles and and shapes and images, and so I woke up. And, and copied them down. And we played them that night on the concert. So um, I felt lucky about that. I feel lucky that at, at the same time, you know, uh, living in the South Bronx, which could have been tough, but somehow I remained focused. And even though my mother didn't necessarily want me to be a musician because it's a rough life. I don't know what she thought, but she, she didn't really want me to do that. But it, but every time I went down Manhattan, lower Manhattan and came back at three o'clock in the morning, she was there with my dinner waiting for me. 
you know. And so it was that kind of support that I have to feel lucky about that. Um, and I think the, and all of these little things where I'm walking down the, 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 the school library and I go inside um, an aisle, a poetry aisle, and I grab this book by Kenneth Patchen called Sleepers Awake. And I start reading it and I say, wow, this is, this is, this is, this is feeding me. So I was always fed by, you know, you can call it serendipitously or, or um, by chance. I don't know. I was just happy I was fed. So all of these things were being conveyed in the interviews of how I got from A to Z. Mm -hmm. And that's the wonderful thing about creativity is that everybody is on a path, but they all get there differently. And uh, when I was doing musician interviews, these conversation books, I, I noticed a lot of similarities were that every musician, whether European or American, they heard some jazz on the radio. They heard Louis Armstrong. And that kind of you know, created a spark. Mm -hmm. And then they go home. Like Oliver Lake said, you know, he said his uncle had a saxophone in the closet that he wasn't using. And so he talked to his uncle, so he had that saxophone. And so he finally gave him the saxophone. Or, mm -hmm. or, or, your, or your cousin plays the drums. Or he, you know, it's just always something that, 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 that gets you into uh, where you want to be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and hopefully, you know, you don't get too sidetracked with other, uh, with what I called, uh, was talking to Gracia Marco yesterday, a long time and and uh, you know I was telling I, I used the word hanky panky as long as you don't get caught up in any hanky panky because hanky panky can really detour you you know and uh, but you can get a lot done even with that so um, so with the with the cataloging of the compositions and just talking about it uh, and there were probably lots of things that that didn't really get into the book because you can't remember everything and you remember different things um you know at different times so uh but I, I think that um uh you know it came out well and uh we're getting getting a lot of good feedback and people but again it's the inspiration of one's life that could inspire others and the other thing is to think you see it's very very important for people to think and because I think a lot of the answers you find when you think and you feel, you know, um, yeah. So I think that that's really what you want to get out of all this is to think and feel and, um, and, and just, and live and discover. One of the, one of the really great things about this book, well, there's two things that I want to, talk about or want y'all to talk about one is the relationship between thinking and feeling um and and maybe another way to put it would be the the intellectual life of a musician which it seems so important to establish and to assert because so often jazz music and black music in general has been seen as not intellectual or sub-intellectual or pre-intellectual, you know? And then at the same time, in, in reaction to that dismissal of the music, lots of some musicians try to say, try to move in, in, in the opposite direction with great intensity and then tend to sort of dispense with the whole problem of feeling or with how intense feeling actually manifests itself. So one thing would be to talk about how you think, William, about this relation between thinking and feeling. And then Cisco, you can talk about, you know, how how you how you set out specifically to, to make this in some ways an intellectual biography, right? A, a biography of a of a thinker, right? Well, um, you know, I think we, feelings, it's always said that feelings come first and then we're or rather feelings, then sound, then words. Okay, so you feel something and then you may 
sound out about it, and then you may later describe what it is. And uh, but there, I think the key is also is to feel for people. Uh, call that compassion and to feel that hopefully the intelligence will turn into wisdom and and that's kind of you know the goal or the or the um the, you, you you accumulate knowledge but then it would transform itself into some kind of wisdom followed by compassion um because the world i mean if you just look at the world what makes it fail Okay, it's, it's definitely, we have a lot, we know a lot. We know a lot about everything. We can, you know, we just landed on Mars. We, you know, we've done a lot of things, but it's still failing. And I think one of the things that really makes it fail is compassion and the, um, and lack of love for each other. So I, I think that those are the main two important things that uh that everything has to that supersedes everything as far as as far as I, I see um you know sun Ra talks a lot about the unknown and the known and uh he talks about how you know what we know has really let us down because we know everything and there's some people that know more than everything and they still can't get it. They can't get it together. It's still not right. They're still not happy, and that um, it's 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 a matter of acceptance. You know, through 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 acceptance of the mystery, peace, mm -hmm. and only through peace can we accept the mystery. That's Kenneth Patchen, and uh, so it's it, it it's it's in those areas that that uh, I'm really. I think are, are important because I think it's the X factor. I uh, was talking about this the other day, you know, people, um, and it's also probably in the book and in, in, in one of the other books about, uh, you know, a saxophone player who had um, really, you know, loved John Coltrane and, and he had transcribed all John Coltrane's solos and he could play them backwards and forwards and he, he would dress like he'd look on the album cover and see if Coltrane was wearing a blue suit, he'd have a blue suit, you know, and he'd read all the books that Train was reading and he was really well versed. And, and then he, he, he came to his master and said, master, you know, I, I learned all of everything about Train and I still can't play the saxophone, what's wrong? And simple answer is you're not Train. You see, you, you, everyone's got a different blueprint. So if I'm following your blueprint, I'm not, you know, I, I, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. I, everyone's got to find their own blueprint and what they should be doing, and and put their, you know, steps in a row to, to 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 figure out where they should go, and um, because what I guess I guess when I was in junior high school and early high school, I remember I used to always read about the president of the United States going to Camp David. And 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 uh, and there was during the Vietnam Nam War, and they were dropping bombs and then on the weekends they go to Camp David. And then I saw thinking about the, all the people in the Rockefellers and they have got original Picasso paintings and they've got all of these hills, rolling hills of of farmland and houses and they go every weekend they go and they absorb all this stuff and then on monday they start dropping bombs again because and i said the reason it didn't never affected them if you have all the art in the world it should have softened your heart by now and the reason it didn't is because they felt that they owned the world you know that that they own the world and the world was the mountains were their mountains and and they and and didn't have any humility um you know cal perusia says you know uh humility in the light of the creator on delmark records you know 
And um, so they didn't have that. So it it didn't affect them. So you have to be affected by by people's pain and then activate it by that. You know, you have to you, you have to do that. If not, then it, it's, it's I don't think it's I don't think it's it's working. You know, and I think that's the uh, that's how to find swing. You know, when something's swinging, you know, if a guy's on the street and he's hungry and you bring him some food, that's swing. If he's thirsty, you give him some, something to drink, that's swinging. Or even on your own level, you know, you go to grandma's house and grandma pulls out one of them apple pies, whatever kind of pie she makes, and gives you a piece. That sucker is it's swinging. So all life affirmative action becomes a form of swing and that's what it is. And that's it. So if you put that to your music, then that's what it is. It's not about a musical form. It's about anything that uplifts other people's lives. And that could be as abstract or as uh, the shapes of that can go any kind of way, any kind of way one wants it to go or, or it wants to go. Because um, that's the thing is that the, again, the concept that music is anything that's beautiful. And that's a definition of music. It's not just about sounds, it's about any life affirming gesture that's beautiful is musical. You know, the, the poetry in the music is what makes the music work. The music in the poetry is what makes it work. The dance in the poetry is what makes it work. The poetry in the dance is what makes it work. And uh, so, so they complement each other. Cisco, how how did you make a book that swings? Because it does. How do you do that? How do you write a an intellectual biography that swings? Wow, thank you for that question. Thank you for that that, that comment. Um, you know, I I I was thinking there's various ways I think I can answer this. I mean, number one, you know, I've never heard William use the term synesthesia, but I I, in my conversations with William, as, as the thing that he conveyed to me, I think maybe in our first conversation, is that when he when he thinks about sound, he's you know he, he often talks about color. He's talking about yeah. So I think you know I think of William as an, an artist, kind of in the purest sense, and that he's dealing with all sorts of sort of the elements, um, dealing with color, with sound, with all these sorts of things. So I think you know I, I don't know. I, I, I think coming out, of, I think he conveys it through his music, and that there's sort of this expanded sense of feeling, um, uh, an expanded sense of pain and a sense of, of, of empathy. So, you know, I think in terms of that, I, I think those things were, all, they were, they came out naturally in our conversation. I didn't feel like, uh, you know, that, that we had to search for those things. Those were the things I think sometimes that, that William Parker wanted to talk about the most. Um, I think, uh, you yeah, know, I mean, William is, is, uh, you know, deeply in, yeah, I think, you know, one thing I was thinking is, is that he, that, I think it's something other people have observed of William is that he has maybe the best memory of any person I've ever met. So when we talked about his development as an artist, he was able to tell me, you know, in seventh grade when he was thinking about something and then he read a book and it changed how he thought about that thing or whatever. And so it was an intellectual development from age five, onwards. Um, I mean, it strikes me that, you know, having thought about William's life and, and spent these years writing about him, I, that, you know, he was a deeply, he was deeply engaged with the world around him from a very young age um, and very, very attentive, very observant of the things that he was encountering. It, they, things weren't just whizzing past him or, or you know, he, I think he was deeply, uh, uh, you know, sort of working through whatever it was that he was thinking about or reading or, or listening to or seeing. Um, and the images are quite stark. I mean, I think of, of him talking, of, of William talking about, um, about the Bronx. And I mean, sure, he, William talked a lot about the struggle, the day-to-day -day life, you know, that, that was quite challenging, you know, living in the projects, uh, the Claremont projects and, um, you know, the, the struggles that, that he had, but he also talks about the sky he talks about, um, you know, sort of the beauty that he managed to find there. So I think you know, the sort of 
that kind of connectedness to the to the environment around him, I think is just so strong. And I felt like it came out in our in our conversations. And I felt like it was something that that I wanted to have in the book. Um, and I guess the other thing is, is, you know, I, I, once we got really into talking about his development, I, to me, the, 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 the chapter that I spent the most time on by far is chapter three, the, title, the chapter titled Consciousness. And it's because uh, Williams talked so deeply about all, all those things, I think, that had a transformative impact on him. So he deeply and intellectually engaged with not just one particular genre of music or not one particular, or not even just music. I mean, he was looking at the whole range of arts. Um, so that was something I think that, that came out in our conversations. And I, I, the thing that I remember is that um, I don't think we actually started talking about William Parker as a musician until maybe the fourth or fifth interview. I mean, really, getting into what he was doing as an artist. We, you know, he was talking about the, the films of Stan Brackage, um, the, you know, the, the various, many different poets that he, he read, Amiri Baraka and many others. Um, that's what he wanted, you know, that's, that's what I think William wanted to talk about when we were talking about his intellectual development. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that was such a rich array of, 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 of things that I, I think that, I don't know, I think it really informed how the rest of the book was structured and how we kind of tried to build the rest out. I mean, in a way, chapters two and three really, I think were the first ones, they were the first ones I wrote. And then we kind of built in, in both directions. So, um, yeah, and I, you know, I, I think of this quote, if I can make, I just wanna make one quote here from the book. Um, it's, it was the, the first person that I interviewed uh, other than William Parker was piano player, Matthew Shipp. And, uh, he had so many, um, I thought, really amazing observations of him, who, he, who he's known since the mid 80s. Um, and uh, Mr. Ship said, William's music embodies black universal consciousness, a major custodian of it in the post Amiri Baraka period. And he said, he said, he considers uh, William uh, uh, to be an African-American composer capable of summoning spirits of conjuring such force and speaking to the whole history of the African descended community. In a certain sense, he is a prophet like the prophets of the Old Testament lived alone in the desert. They weren't part of the establishment. They would get divine proclamations and just put them out there. The music that William does just comes through him like that. It's not manufactured. I think when he said that to me, it just really made me think of like, you know, this is, you know, to, to think of, of, of William as, as uh, someone who's dealing with more than arranging notes in a particular order. You know, he's, he's, that doesn't seem to be what William Parker is about. You know, he's, he's, he has, he's engaging with all these things on a much deeper level. Well, I sort of have two questions in mind and I feel like I want to combine them just because, um, just, just to see what happens, <laughs> to see what kind of music we can make. Um, so one is just following up on something you just said, Cisco, when you mentioned Stan Brackage, and it's really a question that we got in the Q&A, um, and I, and I want to encourage all of the folks who are out there to send questions in the, in the Q&A um, that, that I will try to faithfully record and, and, and ask as, as we move, you know, towards, towards the end of the discussion. Um, but Alan Saul writes, Ask William what aspects of Brackage's work are particularly meaningful to you. And I, I wanted to, to put that question in conversation with another question for, for you, Cisco, but I think it's for William too. And it, and it goes with what you were just saying about this sort of total arrangement of the resources that African descended people have at, at, at our disposal. Um, one of the striking things about the book, you, you talk about chapter three as in a way the beginning of the book on some level, but actually the book really begins in West Africa and in the Carolinas, that in a way, William Parker's story begins before the beginning of William Parker, so to speak. And, and, and maybe, maybe those two questions are connected in some way, um, uh, but feel free to, to, to spin off in whatever directions you go to, but but hopefully, William, you will feel a little inspired to talk a little bit about brackets too. It actually reminds me of another 
of a story, which is, I don't know if you remember, but one time I was looking at books in Mass Bookstore, right, on Avenue A. And who do I see but William right. Parker coming in? And he's looking for, I think, old issues of film comment that that Brack, in which there's some article about Brackage. So so I really want to hear more about, about you and Stan Brackage, too. So, Well, when you, and, and everybody can attest to this, uh, is that you're young and you're feeling out of sorts, like, well, should I follow the path of everybody else or shall I follow what I really feel inside? And um, so whenever you run into people who are actually following the path that they feel inside, it's an inspiration. You know, you, 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 you listen to Ornette Coleman and then people are describing Ornette Coleman, you know, that he, uh, he was making his own clothes in the early 50s and 60s and he, he his own way of playing and he did not detour from that you know he had confidence to 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 be himself and i think that's one of the hardest things to to do but once you uh, with me personally once i i mean well first i guess you don't have any choice after a while you can't help but to be yourself once you dive into it and um so I, I used to read about film before I saw these films. I, I would read about, um, I had a lot of film books because I, I guess I started, you know, watching Million Dollar Movie and watching uh, La Strada by Federico Fellini and then later on watching Alphaville, Jean-Luc Godard, and then moving to Francois Truffaut and then getting interested in reading about these other filmmakers who seemed very exciting to me. And, uh, and I began reading essays about, about light and, and film. And uh, so it was more, it was a great inspiration to find yourself. It wasn't like to say, well, I want to make a film the way Stan, I want to play music the way Stan Brackett does a film. Now that, that that wasn't the point. The point was to be inspired by Stan Brackett or anyone that could be um, move you to have confidence to be yourself. Uh, you know, a poet Robert Hayden, and I don't mention him that much, but um, uh, June Jordan. You know. Uh, I think in the Bronx, I met Larry Neal was up there at the Third World Cultural Center. And um, all these people were, 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 were inspirations. And it's not like, it, it showed you the way by them being themselves, and now you can be yourself. And so, uh, but confirmation came, and some of the theories came when I saw um, Brackage's The Text of Light. I think it's 1978. And I had been talking since 73 about uh, light. I was always talking about how the string of the bass is a prism and the bow, no, the string of the bass is a band of light and the bow is a prism. And then I found out and saw this movie by Stan Brackage where he was filming light going through an ashtray. And that just say, that says, wow, I'm on the right track. You know, I'm not crazy. And, and you always need a good confirmation from somebody sometimes in your life to to move on to the next level or just to, just to make sure you're, 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 you're dealing in the right, right spot. And our people were always, um, uh, all the filmmakers were all different. And, you know, uh, I think you mentioned a lot, Jonas Mikas in there, you know, he's Lithuanian and uh, came to America and he just started making things happen. And uh, just, just being able to formulate your own way of talking, of writing, of seeing and hearing. So I, I think it was, uh, you know, that, that's how, um, you know, Brackage was inspiration to me. Plus I liked his idea of, um, you know, a family, you know, and, and moving to Denver, Colorado and, 
and uh, Boulder, Colorado, and, and living up in the mountains and you know, filming the, the Dog Star Man. So I thought it was just very, very interesting. But at the same time, um, you have the blues and you have the, 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 the root music that comes from Africa that's inside you that seems to be there whether you want it or not. And, and, and um, you know, that Lou Donaldson is talking about, you know, everything I do from now on is going to be funky. Uh, that was it. You know, I found out that the funk does not go away. And no matter how, so he said, you know, he said, well, you know, that's why I never considered myself avant-garde. You know, because I, I, I was really based, if you listen to really listen, you see that everything I was doing was, 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 was not very far from the funk. And that's what I liked about playing with Cecil Taylor is because he never told you what to play and you could really play, if, if you separated all what he was doing and pull out the drums and pull the bass out, you say, that's some really funky stuff. You know, and that's where it was. The same with playing with Milford Graves. You could play, you know, Latin. You could play, but 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 again, it was roots. It was something that had to do with the roots and the basic thing that comes from the feel holler, that comes from um, this heart and soul. And that's you know, and that's what I was. I found out that's what I was. I was really really connected to, and that's the clan I I came from. Also. I found out that I, I, I came from the Curious Clan. And the Curious Clan is someone who like, for one reason or another, is multidimensional, is interested in so much that they, I call them greedy, but you know, they're interested in this, they're interested in that. And it, um, and so like, if you, if you, you see like the a 10 CD box set, you say, well, there's all kinds of music in there. And it's and I, I that's all what I'm interested in. It wasn't like it wasn't very far from what I was because a large part of my training was not only watching the movies, but going to, to see these movie soundtracks. You know, Lawrence of Arabia, Maurice Jarre, um uh you know, Lalo Schifrin, the big arrangers, Quincy Jones, uh, Oliver Nelson, all of that stuff. I mean, I loved anything like being in the botanical gardens and liking every single flower and plant that's in there that, that was me um i'm thinking now about i want to play some music so bad but i don't know i feel like i probably shouldn't um i'm scared of the of the technology i don't want to but i'm but what you just said about the funk seems so apt to me and it makes me think of two projects in particular. Um, one is, uh, well, one is the the Curtis Mayfield, the inside songs of Curtis Mayfield, which I wish I would love to hear both of y'all talk about. And then the other thing is this beautiful record, the violin trio record that you did called Scrapbook. And that oh, song yeah. Scrapbook, which is a genuinely funky record, <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Actually, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna risk smile, it. Fred, you're making me smile. <laughs> I'm gonna risk it. I'm gonna risk it. I just want everybody to hear just a couple minutes of, of this song scrapbook. So I'm hoping this will work. Um and 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 I'm hoping this will work. We'll we'll see. Y'all hear that?
know it's sacrilegious to stop it, but um, that's that's William Parker on bass, Hami Drake on drums, and the late great Billy Bang on violin. And um, like I said, that's a that's a funky record <laughs> to me. I love it. I love it. Um, that you start off sounding like Bootsy Collins. <laughs> um, how do you, I wanted to, to shift gears for a minute and, and, and ask, ask both of y'all, really, I, I feel like it's really important to hear from you too, Cisco, in terms of how to, you know, what it means to, to try to convey, you know, um, to give a kind of critical analysis of these concepts and ideas that, that that William has been spinning out on all these different multiple levels for, for so long. And one of them is, is um, the tone world. Um, and I, I would love to hear both of y'all talk about the tone world. William, I think you should, maybe you should lead the way. Okay, well, in the, in the 70s, like from 72 to 78, I did a lot of playing. I mean, a lot of gigs because around the loft scene and used to go everywhere in the Lower East Side to play Studio Wee, Studio Ribby, Alley's Alley. And um, I was playing one day and um, it came time to me to take my solo and I began to, to, to lift my bass up in the air like it was the same way a saxophone player plays a saxophone. I lifted my bass up in the air and then I began to, my eyes were going inside of my head and I began seeing these colors. And I really left from that bandstand to another plane of existence. I mean, in those days, we were really playing hard. We used to play for three hours straight and um, and with high energy, which was you know training for later on, when I, I ended up playing with 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 Cecil, but um, you know it was it was uh, I, I begin to figure out that when you when you get into a creative spot and things are flowing and things are coming through you, and the music is taking a life of its own you stepped in from this world to the tone world when you're writing and 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 you begin to write and next thing you know you've written 10 pages 12 pages 20 pages and 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 it's almost like it's it's again it's taking a life of its own it's flowing and you can tell the difference when it's flowing and when it's not you don't have to think about it when it's flowing and it just moves and then i thought about the idea okay every time you play if you go to the tone world, then there's this image of you go to a corridor made of light. And if you walk down this corridor, at the end of the corridor, there's a door. And inside that door, are all the secrets of life. Now, if you play the right tones, that door opens up and you get to enter inside that, that door, that room. And you're still playing. And the, drum is playing and the saxophone player is playing and then you, you come out and then you go back to the bandstand but you're able to keep one of those secrets inside you and you're beginning to learn how to live and beginning to learn to not get in the way of the music and to let them that realize that you have to let the music fly okay and uh, and that's part of being a composer is to let the music go its own way and trust the music. You know, music comes from the mountains, the trees, from nature. So it's it's very strong. You don't want to interfere. So uh, and that was the beginning of developing the tone world or the idea that you, you go inside this place of enlightenment and that's the tone world. And uh, you you learn unconsciously about how to live and how to treat people. 
Thank you, William. I, maybe I'll just add a few comments. I'm certainly not going to explain anything better than what William just said. I think it's um, brilliant. Um, you know, I, I when I think William talked about the tone world in the very first interview we'd ever did before we had ever you know started talking about doing this book, um, and I think that's when I realized how uh, deeply you know, how deep of a thinker he was in terms of what he was doing um, as a musician. Um, you know, and, I, and maybe to connect it back to your earlier question, it strikes me this is in one way where the intellectual absolutely meets the, the, the you know, this sort of feeling, meets the spiritual um, sort of aspects of this. And, you know, the, the, the natural is connected with the spiritual, with the personal, with the universal in this, in, in William's conception of the tone world which I think is, you know, it's it's an all kind of an all-encompassing kind of way of thinking about music and about sound and about the meaning of of all of this stuff and how it relates, I think, to each, you know, to one another. Um, if I can jump back to the earlier question you asked, you're, I think you, uh, Professor Moten, you you asked about basically why why write a book about William Parker that begins in West Africa in the seventh century. And I, so I, I, I can give a, a, maybe a, I'll try to give a quick answer to that. Um, Take your time. Okay. I mean, first of all, I, I think, um, you know, I guess the, maybe the easy answer is to say, well, I think, you know, William Parker's music is of historical importance. So I thought creating a, con you know, basically building a context for the music that's of the, you know, on that same level, I thought was necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think too often we actually act as if, um, music, you know, music you know, and musicians kind of come out of the ether or something. And, you know, that, you know, we'll, I'm sure we've all seen biographies where the first, you know, the first opening lines are about the person being born. And that's fine. I, but I think, I think, you know, drawing on much longer historical kind of trajectories, I, I thought were, was necessary for understanding who William Parker is. Um, and I, you know, just thinking about the quote I took from Mr. Uh, Ship earlier, you know, if 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 William is the embodiment of, of, of if he embodies Black universal consciousness, um, we need to dig back before 1952 to understand where his music is coming from. You know, if he's if he's a summoner of spirits and you know, all the all the things that we said. Um, you know, I, I think the, you know, it, I think it's important to, to to have gone back. Now, I also think it's it's a matter of of um, digging through sort of digging up and trying to to reconstruct a history that it is otherwise perhaps obscured because of um, you know the history of, of of violence the history of slavery the history you know of uh, African Americans in the United States I mean just mm -hmm. trying to come somehow grapple with that and figure out how to to have to to place William within that history to me that was really important um, and I, I mean I, I William had 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 done a DNA test, so we had, you know, sort of bits and pieces of evidence that I thought that you know that we could, you know, that that he that he was willing to have out there, and so we 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 basically took that and tried to reconstruct it as best we could. I think there were also just you know as we as I delved into his family history, I mean some of some of um, you know which which it went in directions I think that maybe neither of us neither of us expected, but. Um, also kind of looking through that and, and seeing a lot of, of kind of some of the main themes and features of black history in this country coming out right there in his personal kind of ancestry and his, um, uh, you know, in, in that history, I thought also informed a lot about the music, um, mm -hmm. you know, stretching all the way through. So to me, that was, I think, a key thing to do. And I, I've noticed that a, a lot of the reviews of the book already have seemed to be sort of surprised that that initial, ch that first chapter is there. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really imagine the book in some ways without that chapter, I think now that it's there. So. Well, it, I mean, it, 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 it feels absolutely necessary and absolutely appropriate. And, and if there's a precedent for it, then part of the trouble with these reviewers is that they haven't been made aware of that precedent. Because I was thinking also of the sort of beautiful ways in which uh, in which Robin Kelly's biography of Thelonious Monk begins in, in Carolina, too. Yeah. Um, and and, it, and it, there's this thing that I guess I've been thinking about. I'm, I've been trying to imagine the, the movement, Cisco, you know, from your first book 
to, to this book and just thinking, and then also just in terms of your own intellectual trajectory and, and reading your web page and thinking, I'm so fascinated with the way you're interested in port cities. Hmm. And New York is a port city. And, I'm, and I was thinking about, to me, like, I, it makes me want to think about Williams music as, as a port city music. Um, that, and, and, and even and in a different way, the part of what it means to be in New York, or to be from New York now at this historical moment, New York is, New York is a Caribbean city. You know, um, it's a it's a it's a city that is part of a kind of a general Caribbean that goes a lot further north than we are led to believe. You know, um, and obviously, and in a in a different way, you know, jazz music is Caribbean music. You know, New Orleans is a Caribbean city. New York is a Caribbean city, and these are port cities. These are these are cities that are shaped by travel, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, I guess in, it, the other thing that I guess I wanted to say, um, I don't even know if this is leading to a question. Like when I, to me, the two greatest artists, I mean, I shouldn't say it like that. I say, I think of two people in particular and then there's a bunch of other people I think of too, but, but who I also think of in terms of as a New York artist, um, the, the two most profound now living to me, William and, and, and Samuel R. Delaney. And Samuel R. Delaney's work, the great speculative fiction writer, he's so fascinated with ports, with New York as a port city. Um, um, and I'm thinking of the, the loft scene and what it meant to walk along or walk across, you know, Manhattan on Canal Street, because Canal Street is, they call it Canal Street because it used to be a canal, right? Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just talking, I'm going to shut up now, but I'm wondering if any of that resonates with either of you. Um, that, 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 that this is just art in this music of travel, of port, of, of what it means to be open to new stuff, to open to the new stuff that only living in a port city can make you, can, 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 can afford for you. Well, I would love to respond because I, I, I've thought a little bit about that. I, I, I you know, I, it, you're right, you know, New York's a port city. It's also oddly, I think, since the, the the terrible damage that Robert Moses did to the city, we we have we're cut off from the from the shores in so many parts of the city. It's we're so almost alienated from the water. But mm -hmm. that's a whole other conversation. I think you know, I mean, I, I think my fascination with port cities, my fascination, you know, one of my really my strongest intellectual drive in my my written work is studying human networks. And if you you know you think of a place like New York City, it's it's a whole bunch of human networks kind of overlaid on top of each other. You, might, you, know, you, you talk about New York being a, a Caribbean city. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, New York is an, is an African city in a certain sense. I mean, it, it, you know, it has a, you know, such a strong place in all that. Uh, and I mean, it, New York is a Jewish city. New York, I mean, we could go down the list. I and mean, there's so many, in each one of these- It's a Southern uh, city. <laughs> southern city, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's, I think mean, each one of these is kind of in, you know, interconnects out across the country and across the globe in a way um, that I think is, that's, that's how it, you know, that's how all these things I think are, are connected, you know, in terms of, of cultural connections, social connections, um, you know, the way that people circulate around. And, you know, in terms of music, I mean, music, music is a, is, to me, all about human networks. It's it's about people meeting and doing these things together. Um, you know, conveying sounds from one to another, and, and sometimes doing this together. I mean, um, you know, all those things couldn't you know couldn't happen without those vast networks that I think that connect all all over the place. And you know, if we think about, um, I mean, one of the and that's the really the reason why New York is a culturally rich place. In it, because of all those connections and all those kinds of you know connections globally. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'll, William, do you want to comment? Well, I, I think that that's uh, a beautiful image. Uh, I mean, I always thought of you know New York as a uh, very diverse, and uh, and I always always said, well, it was a melting pot that never really melted. Uh, because when you ride the subways, you see people from all over the world on the subway car, 
then they get off and they all go to their neighborhoods and there's not too much crossover. But at the same time, I think that um, that's maybe that's how it's supposed to be to maintain the cultures. And that, and that the crossing of the cultures um, happen, you know, when necessary. <clears throat> and, um, but in any case, there's, there's just beauty everywhere. There's beauty everywhere in, in, in this city. And um, I mean, I really love New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans is very special, but I never came to New York. That's the thing. So, and what I mean by that, I was born here and I never left here, so I never came here. And so maybe someone who lives in New Orleans and never left doesn't feel the way I feel when I go to New Orleans because they, they're, they're just up in the middle of it. And then and they find it you know, not so thrilling as I might find it. But I, I think it's all, um, you know, it's all connected with some kind of great beauty that, uh, you know, that we're trying to preserve and uh, in, in culture and trying to hold on to certain things um, that shouldn't, I mean, that's the thing, a a a every day something is dying and that, that shouldn't die. You know, I mean, there's no reason why it, it should really die. So, uh, but that's what culture is for. Culture is to try to help things not die, you know. Um, and so education, you know, there's a difference between, all right, education is, you know, is, is a tricky question because you're educated to, to know facts maybe and to know about things, but uh, you also have to be educated to realize that things are dying and how can we stop them from dying and, and, and keep that hope alive, uh, you know, in order to survive, as they say, you know. There's a, we have a question. And again, I want to encourage everybody who has questions to type them into the Q&A and I will uh, read them um, verbatim for, for the remainder, especially of the 20 minutes or so we have left. But this is an interesting question. It's from an anonymous attendee who, says, who asks, have Hamid Drake's drumming seems very Louisianan to me. The rolls, the march beats, et cetera. And I wonder if his playing has brought more Southern or New Orleans inflections to your music. Well, you know, uh, Hamid was born in Louisiana. He's born in Monroe, Louisiana, uh, as was Fred Anderson. And, um, and he, in a lot of things, have influenced his drumming. But, uh, you know, I'm from New York. And uh, we have a thing, you know, like the, like to me, people from Chicago, oh, I'm going to get, never mind, I, I'll retract that. But there's a thing, you know, like there's the country and there's the city. And, you know, <laughs> but no, I, I don't think that Hamid has brought the, uh, the uh, you know, that part out in me. But I think it's a blend of whatever part I bring and we blend, blend it together and it kind of, uh, you know, it kind of works in many different ways. Cause we're all brothers and sisters, no matter where we come from. And, uh, you know, that's an inside story uh, that I guess we shouldn't tell on the, uh, on the air about <laughs> the, different, the different places in America and the, and the way people talk and the, and the way they, you know, the Southern droll, you know. And uh, cause I, I've had cousins, you know, I, go, I used to go to South Carolina and I used to have to tell people I was from York, North Carolina, because if I told them I was from New York, they didn't like that, you know. And they, I said, no, I'm from York, North Carolina, because you know? they had a different style and different way of doing things. And, and we were related, but we were attached to our turf. And so, it was, but it's always interesting when you do, uh, when you come together. I mean, it's, it's really an, how to, the similarity, the difference at the same time. You know, what is what Billy Bang used to say, nobody hears the music in the same way, you know, uh, and, and that's how it is. Nobody hears it the same way, which is great. Just to, to kind of follow up on that and actually to link it up with something you said, Cisco, I was wondering about when you were talking about your interest in, in networks, okay? 
And I started thinking, well, I wonder if networks is a good way to think about how you operate as a, as a, as a composer, but also as a, maybe the word for it would be a ranger. Um, and, and I'm thinking about it in terms of like, like maybe the larger group work, especially like the Lil Huey Creative Music Orchestra. Um, but sorry, I, I, I'll talk to you in a few minutes, son. My, my son's, uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm interested in what, in what, in, in, in how you think about how you get people together in your music, how, which is to say, how you get the musicians together in your music. What, what is the mechanism through which you actually can create a situation in which the music is released in which the music can flow when you're dealing with so many different people, as you say, from so many different places. Well, um, what I what I learned is that, um, you know, like when you have a quartet or a trio, and we're actually one of the first musicians I played with, you know, like Daniel Carter, Roy Campbell in the old days, I put, took my bass out and we began to play. And there was a connection. We didn't say what we were going to play. We didn't, you know, at first, you know, meeting, we didn't know each other, but it, it clicked. And he said, well, why did it click? Um, it clicked because we could hear each other. We could breathe together. We could feel each other. And we didn't impose anything on each other. So everybody could feel relaxed and be themselves. So part of the thing is not imposing anything on the musicians. At the, but at the same time, having a way to organize the music, but but with uh, without really telling people what to do, but that hopefully they'll be in the right place and the music will tell you what to do. And, the, and so the idea that the music is a conductor, the music itself is a composer and uh, you set things up by feeling. You, know, you, 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 you meet somebody and I never heard them play before and they say they wanna play with me. And I get a good vibe from them, I say, come on down. And they play and it works. Mm -hmm. And 90% of the time that it, it works, it works. And, and, and the more you do it, the more you breathe together and feel what you're doing. And then you make adjustments and you make adjustments and modifications. You, uh, you show people which way to go and what to do by the music. And that was the whole thing about universal tonality or self-conduction is that everybody conducts themselves. You don't conduct them, they conduct themselves. And, uh, and it works. And if you do it over and over again, it works on a very high level level and it's all about feeling it's all about feeling so the, the follow-up question and and i'm sure it's not a contradiction to your mind but it, it sometimes feels like a contradiction in mine so i want you to solve this problem for me because on the one hand there's this thing about letting people releasing the musicians to, 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 in a certain sense, be themselves, like you were saying at the very beginning. But then at the same time, there's this beautiful moment at the very beginning of chapter eight, which is the, the chapter called Into the Tone World, and which talks about the Little Huey Created Music Orchestra. The epigraph that you've chosen, Cisco, is William writing, if you look at nature, who's the soloist? Is it the tree? Is it the maple? Is it the oak? Is it the sun? Who's the band leader? Is it the river? Is it the mountains? So on the one hand, there's letting people be themselves in the music. And on the other hand, there's this question, but who's the soloist? How does that go together? I'm sure that it does. I just need it to be explained to me. Well, it, it, I, I think that uh, everybody's got different properties. So some trees are tall, some trees are small, some trees have red, some orange, you know, the, the, and they work together, providing shade, letting the sun come in. The, the, these insects live over here. These animals feed off of here. It's all part of a, a, a natural scheme of things. 
and you just have to be in tune to it or attuned to it and um and breathe and flow with it and, and take a chance um that that it will it will work and then you modify i mean it's like it's like my job as the organizer of the band or the ensembles is to immediately, it's just like teaching kids. It's like, you have to make an immediate diagnosis of this kid. The kid's coming in and every day the kid comes in late. Okay, now you have two choices. You can say, oh, this kid's coming in late. You go to the principal's office or you can try to find out why he's coming in late. And then you find out that he's coming in late because he's got two other younger brothers. He's got to take to two different schools before he gets to your class. So then you have to, so the idea is, okay, now you know. So you have to make adjustment to him for what he's going through, you know, the bravery that this kid is going through or what anybody's going through. So you have to figure out um, how to, get pe people comfortable so they can bring out their essence. And once everybody's bringing out their essence, it works. It works, it's just like little, little, even smaller kids in the playground. They all, they, they all play together. You know, if you took some kids from Japan, from China, from Russia, from Africa, and you put them in the playground and they don't even speak the same language. After a while, they'd be playing together because they're feeling each other. And, that, and that's how it is in music. And, and that's what you practice for. You practice and train yourself. And, and this is a, a quote from Cecil Taylor. You, you train yourself to respond to music. You train yourself to, to allow the music to flow. And you do that by just constantly doing it every day. Every time you play, you learn something. Every time you meet somebody, you learn something. And that's what and that's what it's about. You 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 begin to get into the world of sound and silence, and um, and it's a, it's an endless process. It goes on from the time you first pick up an instrument until the time you you know you die. If you're still playing music, it's 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 endless. The more you know the more you need to know. And, um, and you can develop your myth structures. You can develop whatever kind of structure you want according to how you hear music and how you feel things. We got one question from Layla Adu Gilmore, um, who writes, I'm gonna direct it to you, Cisco, especially. Um, at what point, or was there a point in which you're listening to William's process, you're listening to his, his music and his music making, did it affect your writing process? Do you find yourself having become a different writer as a function of this deep immersion in his, in his music? Wow, that's a question. Um... I think undoubtedly it did seep into my subconscious, um, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it, one can never convey music in words fully. You know, it's, I think it's always an inadequate process, you know, whether you're a music critic or, you know, a, a, a scholar who writes about music or, or any, you know, any, any, on any level. So, you know, I, I think um, the best that we can hope for is that the music will somehow instill it in ourselves somehow, and uh, that we'll be able to feel that, feel it, and 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 uh, let it kind of flow through us. I think of of you know, I mean, so much of Williams' music, I think, um, you know, has that ability to kind of uh, you know pick a person up and carry them and and transform them. I mean, it's very transformative music. It's not music that you can hear in the background and, and kind of you know. Uh, ignore I think it's music that that kind of takes hold of you so yeah I think undoubtedly uh for sure uh, I'd have to think more about you know if there's I don't know if I have any specific examples of it but I think I think music and language are, are closely linked so so certainly certainly listen to 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 Williams music and to you know to the to to uh improvise music which is so you know so 
that created in, in the moment and in the present, I think, I think it calls people to a kind of greater consciousness in a way, a greater um, alertness to what's happening around them. So yeah, I, I, would, I guess I would really think that it has had an effect on me. Um, yeah, you know, I think to, 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 to shift it around a little bit um, in another direction is, is you know, there's, there's a comment that during the peer review process with, with the publisher, with Duke University Press, um, I do remember getting a, uh, a, uh, a comment back from one of the, one of the outside readers who, who said that, that, you know, in constructing the narrative that, that William's voice had actually become the dominant voice in the narrative. And I think that was a conscious effort. And I, I was trying to put William, you know, William's voice out there as, as much as I could. And I hope some of that, some of the music kind of came through in that, but, you know, it's certainly his, his words, um, you know, foremost uh, in that process. Uh, and at that point, then I thought, okay, I guess I pushed it as, as, as far as I can and, you know, or pushed it as far as I should maybe um, and trying to, to, to put the narrative together. So, yeah, thank you. I love that question. Oh, thank you, Layla. Oh, I, we got three more questions. Um, and I think we have just enough time to do them all. I'm gonna save one for last. Um, but from an anonymous attendee, maybe this is the most important, crucial question. Um, and they ask, when and where can we see you live, COVID notwithstanding, William? I've got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's a good question. Well, I, I think March twenty, March sixteenth, I'll be doing a virtual. Or oh, you mean my, you, by, by live? You don't mean virtual. You mean live, live. Okay, because um, I'm playing at at Smalls on March third, but it won't be live. It'll be virtually broadcast. I've never been to Smalls. I'll be playing with Francisco Mela's trio March third, and then March sixteenth virtual again i'll be doing a salon and i'll be doing a piece called um blinking of the ear and um i'm working now you can come sit but live i don't know okay live i don't know come sit. vision festival and maybe some of the things with uh oh, when is the vision festival it's the last two weekends okay of july. i just been informed at the vision festival the last two weeks of july uh, I probably will be playing there, and that's 2020 uh, July. Yeah. So, um, second question from Chad Powers: How do you approach structure and form in your spontaneous musics? Are these the same thing? What role does tuning systems have in these approaches? Well, okay. Uh, I get this question sometimes about structure. And I would say that I haven't met, seen anything yet in this world that doesn't have structure. I mean, it's hard to, have, to create anything that doesn't have structure. Whether the structure is, you know, someone plays something and then 57 seconds later they play something else or three hours later they play something else. Um, so. I'm not concerned about structure. I'm not concerned about form. Uh, I'm concerned that each musician is tuned up to himself and tuned up to be able to, when they get to the bandstand is play and not fool around and really get to the center of the music. And, and, um, and that's, that's the only system I'm worried about is when you, you, you play, you're playing something that's going to, shake the world, that's going to change people, that's going to uproot trees and cause spiritual, political revolution. That's what I'm concerned about. Um, I feel like uh, we just only really begun to scratch the surface. Um, we got to have another conversation in which we start with revolution and see where we go from there. Um, but there's one last question from uh, actually an old dear friend of mine, a great uh, student and scholar who writes a lot about sound and music named Christoph Magone. And he, uh, it's a beautiful question. I, I, I wanna see what, 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 what comes of it. He asks, 
Could the soloist be time? The way it creates a space for the sequencing of the solos. Okay. Um, the soloist could be the whole band. Okay, instead of an individual. And uh, so you take, if you have a quartet and they're all playing together, they, that if you take those sounds, that could be the solo. And, there, and, and if you look at them in another band, then um, they're participating in that band. You can call it the band in the sky. You can call it the, the large orchestra. Um, I remember when Albert, someone said to Albert Eiler um, that, well, you sound like uh, you, you, you sound like Pharaoh, which he doesn't, by the way. And, uh, and then and y'all both, and then Train sounds like you and Pharaoh sounds like you and y'all all sound together. And then he said, well, it's not that we sound like each other, is that if you take all three of us and put us together, we sound like, we sound like a bigger saxophone player who, who we're representing. And that's, and that's the real uh, head of the orchestra. So, uh, yeah, you know, we're all soloists. We're all soloists and we're all members of the ensemble and uh, we're all working together, we're all working apart, we're all trying to climb up to the top and get like the, uh, the, the Baca people, uh, West Africa, they call them, you know, uh, Banzelli pygmies, you're going up to the top of the tree to get that, to get that honey. Mm -hmm. That's all we're trying to do. This is this great new CD. 10 CD box set by William Parker called Migration Into and Out of the Tone World, which just came out. It's beautiful music. And this is a great book, a great biography of William Parker by Cisco Bradley um, called Universal Tonality. And it's been really fun and great to be with both of y'all today to talk about the book and to talk about y'all your music. Um, it's been an honor. Thank you. Um, Thank, it, you. Thank you. Made, Professor. It, there's this cool one. The first time I saw you, William, it was at a, it was at the little club in the Lower East Side. It used to be called Tonic. And I saw you with other dimensions in music. And, and you played something. And I actually believed it. It lifted Daniel Carter off his feet. <laughs> And you've been lifting and sweeping us off our feet for a long time. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. Thank you. And um, let's uh, take it out with a little bit of music from other dimensions in music this time, which is a great band with the late, great Roy Campbell, drummer Rashid Bakir, um, Daniel Carter on saxophone, William Parker on bass. And Faye Victor joined y'all for this this album called Kaiso Stories. This is like one of my favorite songs. Uh, it's uh, called Kitsch Goes Home. And I'm assuming that the Kaiso reference in the title that the Kitsch in question is Lord, the great Calypsonian Lord Kitchener. So maybe we'll go out with a little bit of this. Um, if I can remember how to share my screen sound. Um, and, uh, and just to say, um, Again, thanks everybody so much for for joining us tonight. So. Uh. Thank <laughs> you.